This is a rather short lecture, only about 25 minutes, but it is significant because it gives you a chance to hear from Dr. Robert Siemens. You've already heard numerous references to Bob Siemens, who was Secretary of the Air Force during the beginning of the space shuttle program. Dr. Siemens had a long career combining teaching at MIT, working in the aerospace industry, and at NASA, both as associate and deputy administrator during the Apollo program. We invited him to come and talk about his re recollections of how the military viewed the use of the shuttle, since, as you've already heard, military requirements were critical in determining the final configuration of the space shuttle. Dr. Siemens mentions the MOL, or MOL program, the Manned Orbiting Laboratory, a concept for an early space station which the Air Force wanted to build. The Air Force selected a group of military astronauts to train for the MOL program. They would have been launched in Gemini capsules on Titan rockets. Well, the program was canceled in 1969, and some of the MOL astronauts were transferred to NASA, where they eventually flew on the space shuttle. Bob Crippen, actually, the pilot on the first shuttle flight, was one of these original MOL astronauts. It turned out that on the day that Bob Siemens gave his lecture to the class, I had to be out of town, so I asked one of my colleagues, Pete Young, a colonel in the U.S. Air Force who was on loan to our department for several years, to introduce Dr. Siemens. You should pay special attention when Dr. Siemens discusses his initial reservations about the policy that all payloads should be launched on the shuttle, which of course was necessary to ensure a sufficient flight rate to keep the costs down. Bob points out that human lives should not be put at risk just to launch satellites, which can be launched with unmanned vehicles. And this actually is the conclusion that NASA finally came to after the Challenger accident. You'll hear a question about why reusable unmanned vehicles couldn't be developed to launch satellites. Dr. Siemens was uncommittal on this, but remember that this lecture took place back in 2005, long before SpaceX and Blue Origin developed their recoverable and reusable first stages, an example of which is shown while Dr. Siemens is talking. Bob Siemens is really a very pivotal uh, person, not only in the space shuttle story, uh, but also in, in the Apollo program, which he can probably talk to you at a separate time, but I think he'll like to spend 10 or 15 minutes talking about his role in the space shuttle story. Right. Okay, here we go. Uh, uh, just wondering where to go to get comfortable. Let, let, me, let me just take you back, first of all, to, uh, uh, to the early 60s. I know that's going way, awful far back. But uh, uh, that's when I joined NASA as a general manager. Uh, and before we knew it, uh, we'd gone from a, a billion dollar a year operation with the Mercury program to uh, the situation where we were given the assignment of putting men on the moon. And that was a gigantic shift in, in our responsibility. Uh, and, and in all of the planning and in, in the uh, uh, discussions and so on, uh, we, we wanted and we did work very closely with the Department of Defense. Uh, uh, the Department of Defense had all kinds of assets that were, were going to be required in, in the space program. The, the Navy, for example, to pick up the astronauts. And uh, one example, a major example most people never heard of, and that is we had to construct very large facilities of which the most uh, f famous and obvious is the vertical assembly building and the launch facility down at the Cape. And you just saw the shuttle taking off from that facility. Uh, and uh, in operating down there at the Cape, there already was Cape Canaveral. And there wasn't room for what we were going to do to fit on Cape Canaveral. We looked at seven different world sites and finally decided to camp on Merritt Island, which is just across the river from Cape Canaveral. Because, uh, again, the Department of Defense had, uh, had all kinds of facilities down there with a the tracking range and so on. But the biggest support that we got was in the building of those facilities. Uh, with absolutely uh, no competence in, 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 in NASA to build uh, the largest structure in the world, the VAB, or um, or many other facilities for assembly and for test and so on. So the Corps of Engineers was a major part of the operation. 
I, I just, I'm bringing this out because uh, uh, we, we had to figure out how far we we're going to go with our launch vehicles on a, on a, on a shared basis. Uh, this is before anybody thought of a, uh, of, of, a, of a manned shuttle that would carry stuff up and, and stick it into orbit. Uh, but we, we put together a, 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 a planning organization. It actually operated for over, over a year's time. A um, uh, uh, fellow named Golovin for, for NASA, a fellow named Kavanaugh for the Department of Defense put this together. One of the, one of the big emphasis was the, the use of the Titan. Uh, the, the Titan was coming along to the point where we thought the, 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 the earliest version would be, would be suitable uh, for the Mercury program. And uh, at that time, in, the, in, in, in 1961, we were thinking that Mercury only well, weighed 3,000 pounds. You could put one man in it. You couldn't do much with it. But if we could, in effect, just enlarge it and have a more powerful vehicle than Atlas, namely namely uh, namely the Titan, uh, we could really have a vehicle that, uh, that would have some, uh, some capability to go run through a lot of the orbital uh, operation and so on that were going to ultimately be required for going to the moon. And, and out of that came uh, the planning for the Titan III, the Titan IV, and uh, uh, vehicles that proved right off the bat and over time and still are uh, uh, very, very important to uh, uh, to our d uh, defense capability, as well as uh, well. I, I don't think that's quite true. I don't think we are using any of those assets today within NASA. Uh, uh, and if, if you th if you then go go forward in time, uh, in in 1968, uh, uh, I've been down there in NASA for. For, for seven and a half years, I planned to go down for two. I came back. With, MIT was not, nice enough to invite me back, and I came back right here as a Hunsaker professor. Uh, to my very great amazement, uh, uh, I got a call one day from somebody I'd never met, uh, uh, namely Mel Laird. I just knew, I just barely knew that he had been uh, uh, designated by, by Nixon uh, to be the next Secretary of Defense. He said, are you going to be down here in Washington in the next day or two? And as a matter of fact, I was, because I was going to go down the next day to get on a plane and fly down and see the launch of Apollo 8, which was going to fly around the moon. Uh, and, uh, and he said, well, come on for lunch. So uh, that's when he uh, asked if I'd be willing to be the secretary of the Air Force. I told him that's absolutely impossible. We just moved our family back here. My wife's in the hospital, which she was, uh, but he was very persistent. And, and after about uh, ten days, I, I agreed to go back down in the government. And uh, but that's a, that's a long story. You don't want to hear the details of getting my wife well and getting a house and all that stuff. Uh, now, w one thing that I inherited right off the bat was the manned orbital laboratory, and and, and e even then it was clearly in in some jeopardy. Uh, uh, when programs start getting a ceiling built in where they say, yeah, we're going to keep it going, but uh, it's going to be kept going at a level of, and I, I forget what the level was for MO, something like a 500 million or something like that. Uh, and uh, because any large program over time, it, there's always opposition to it, and there's more time for it to be shot down. and. Uh, and ultimately eliminated. I, I realized that uh, that it was in deep trouble when uh, uh, I was over in the Bureau of the Budget talking to a junior member of the Bureau of the Budget, and he said, uh, "I hope you realize that uh, that the shuttle is in, in 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 deep trouble from a standpoint of uh, of support here in the White House." And uh, so I went back to Mel Mel Laird, and uh, and I said, "Look, I." One thing I want to do is to have, have one shot with the president to see uh, if he will be sure he fully understands the, what the capability MOL will be. It was, it was far along. Uh, uh, lots of expense had gone into it, including ma major uh, uh, facility construction. 
out of, out of Vandenberg. And uh, so I had my day in court. It was, a, it was a sunny afternoon. I got General Stewart, who was very involved in the MOL, to join me, and, and Mel Laird. And we went over there. It was just Kissinger and, 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 the, and the president. Uh, and uh, I had a few simple-minded charts that showed what we were going to do from a resolution standpoint if we kept going with the MOL and, and what that would mean in terms of, of understanding more clearly what was going on in a given situation. Uh, uh, I, had my, I had my half hour in court. I could see a band outside getting ready to play, so I knew that the president was about to be rushed out for some kind of a ceremony. On, 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 that was a Saturday. Monday morning, I got a call from Kissinger, and he said, Bob, and his, I, I can't really imitate his German accent. That was a very, very fine presentation. And the day later, I found out that MOL was canceled. Uh, uh, that was, yeah, that was with President Nixon. He, he sat there the whole time. He had a you know, yellow fool's cap. He took prodigious notes of everything I was saying. It was sort of nerve-wracking. The President of the United States bothering what I'm saying. Uh, but, but anyway, that, that was, uh, that, that's sort of where I came from, uh, from the MOL. Now, uh, uh, the next step along the way was uh, after Apollo, uh, what was going to happen in space? The, 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 the were to be eight launches of the Apollo uh, lunar program. Uh, Nixon cut that back to two sort of arbitrarily. And, uh, and there were no plans for using those assets. Uh, Jim Webb was my boss in, in NASA. And, uh, and I used to see him. He, uh, he, uh, he was very, very ill the latter part of his life. And, and I'd, I'd drop by, uh, and, uh, and, and he'd ask me strange questions like, uh, uh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you plan to do with your life before you kick the bucket, kind of questions like that. And, and uh, he's, I haven't got long to live. And I'd say, you, you're doing fine, Jim. And, uh, and, uh, and I'm just going to work along, see what I can do to help out here and there. Uh, but anyway, his, his, his big thrust was, we felt we were building a, a major capability for the country, and now it's all being wa washed, washed away. Uh, and what's going to replace it? Uh, 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 the, uh, the, 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 the shuttle came up uh, as, a, as an option. It, it actually, you say, on, on the surface, it makes an awful lot of sense to, uh, to, to, to recover something. Uh, uh, we uh, 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 could easily, easily visualize a, a transportation system for the, for the country where every time a 747 went across the country with a payload, everybody jumped out and, and then you threw it in the ocean. Uh, it didn't seem to make much sense. You, you just knew it had to be more efficient to, to reuse something, although with Gemini, we had looked into that possibility. We were recovering the Geminis. Why didn't we use them again? And we found we're going to have to put probably 75% of the original cost into, into re reactivating the, the, the Gemini. So, so actually, I had a hunch that it wasn't going to be quite as simple as, as, you, as landing an airplane and then taking off again. Uh, uh, the, the, the Air Force was going to be one of the prime users of the shuttle. And, uh, and the question was, how large did the bomb bay, not the bomb bay, how large did the, did the <laughs> how, 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 how large did the experimental bay have to be uh, for, for, for the missions that were going to be carried out? There was no thought, let me just quickly say, of putting armament aboard the shuttle. <laughs> uh, that, I misspoke. Uh, uh, and then the question was how how rapidly. One of the questions was, did you have to did, did you have to recover it if something happened and you wanted to bring something back in a hurry? Uh, and uh, and uh, and to, to to bring it back, you had to get into and you had to had to make a, a coplanar change, and that was uh, 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 going to take a certain amount of, of of energy to put it mildly. And uh, uh, so, 
so anyway, th th those are many of the issues, and I think, uh, as, as I remember it, uh, my, my friends in NASA thought the Air Force was being pretty tough on them. Uh, uh, but, if, but if we were going to accept uh, the use of a vehicle, in all seriousness, uh, as you've just heard, it, it had to have uh, a, a ability to carry out the missions. And, and, and so that was sort of the next step along the way. And then after I got through in, in the government, uh, uh, I ended up some years later out at aerospace uh, and uh, ended up as the chairman of the corporation. And they worked closely with, with that element in the Air Force that was so much involved in, in these type programs that you've just been hearing about. Uh, and we were, we were beginning to go into shock, at least uh, 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 that the, those of, in, the, in the nucleus that were, who were sort of uh, running uh, uh, the aerospace, Eberhard Rechten and, and, and myself, that more and more it appeared that we were going to not be allowed to put anything in space except through the shuttle. Uh, and that seemed to be eminently wrong to think that you're going to have to risk the life of astronauts every time you want to put a, any kind of a satellite in orbit. From a, uh, from a standpoint of a, of a, of a paper clip uh, uh, in the individual who's looking at cost, to just have the one vehicle uh, and use it and use it and use it and thereby supposedly cutting the cost uh, had, had a lot of charm. Uh, and, uh, and it reached the point where uh, 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 he, uh, he, he and I decided we had to try to do something about it. And, uh, and we made an appointment with the then Secretary of the Air Force and said, you've just got to be statching away Titan s somewhere uh, so that if we run into trouble with the shuttle, uh, we're going to be able to move over and, 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 and put these very important payloads uh, uh, in, into orbit, and uh, and then they had the Challenger accident, and at that point, uh, the, the this I think major fallacy in in, in policy uh, was changed back where it should have been. You you, sh you just shouldn't rely on a single vehicle, and th that's my introduction. Yes. You wanted reusability, but you also. Didn't want to risk the lives of astronauts. Why not make a reusable, unmanned vehicle? Okay, that's a good. That's a very good question. And uh, uh, why 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 couldn't we do it? Uh, it, might be, it might be a good de good design challenge for you guys here in this class to investigate that that that, that possibility. I'm unmanned. Yes. 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 Uh, the. Uh, We've gone part way in that direction uh, uh, by, re say, re recovering the shuttle casings. Obviously, the shuttle itself, but uh, 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 trying trying to recover at least elements of the unmanned launch vehicles. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm not prepared to really give you a definitive answer on that. That's a good question. I'll talk about it later. Yes. Um, before the shuttle concept uh, was finalized and the military requirements were finalized for the shuttle, the military had been launching their satellites and their missions using the Titans and the Atlases, correct? So why did this requirement of the shuttle having to be able to bring back a satellite, presumably a military satellite, when that wasn't being done or required beforehand. Like, why, why, why was that created? What was so special about it? We worked very hard on proposals to uh, bring back uh, satellites that were out of fuel or needed refurbishment. Um, but when I was referring to landing with a shuttle uh, with payloads in the bay, that was for a failed mission. And for some reason, the, the payload could not get ejected. You still had to be able to land back with this now a very heavy uh, spacecraft and glide on in and land safely. That turns out to be a really hard thing to do, especially if you're carrying solids and liquids on board 
that we're uh, close to being ready to ignite, so to speak. No. So, no, but there was a talk of retrieving satellites, and as you know, uh, NASA did bring back some satellites, small ones, the Palapa one from uh, Hughes, and also did a lot of uh, very innovative repairs in space. Uh, but when we looked at it from a customer point of view, it turns out there's a lot that wears out in satellites, not just using a propellant, but processors degrade due to radiation, uh, solar panels degrade just due to uh, just uh, micro dust and things like that. And so uh, bringing back a satellite for reuse was never felt at the time we looked at it to be worth, a worthwhile thing to do. And that ties in directly with what I was saying about uh, recovering a Gemini. Yeah. And of course, on top of, 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 of that with the, with the Gemini, the fact you're landing them in the water so they got a good dousing of salt. And, uh, uh, and so the de degradation of uh, of, uh, of the Gemini's was such that uh, it, we just didn't think it made any sense to try to, rec to, to refurbish them. Yeah. So the military was only really looking to capture and service in space that it released, not necessarily capture and bring it back? They never seriously went after the capture and refurbish or release. They really went after uh, really launch and deployment. But I'd say that the uh, in that theme, the most successful stories, actually, of refurbishment is, uh, is the Hubble Space Telescope, and not for the reasons that you think of. When you hear about stories about the Hubble Space Telescope, you hear about Jeff Hoffman going up there and changing processors and fixing the optics. Also, in those missions, they replaced uh, 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 solar panels that were causing huge problems due to thermal warpage and shrinkage and what they call oil canning due to thermal stresses. And so the replacements of those uh, solar panels, which turned out to be not very good, when it as initially designed is one of the really uh, true success stories of man in space. And there is actually a, uh, a very nice video, which maybe you've seen, I hope maybe you have, of the, uh, of the lady astronaut who, who did the replacement of the uh, solar panels on Hubble, pushing out and releasing the solar panels. And the things fly away in the sunshine, look like giant butterfly wings, reflecting all the colors, and then finally fall into the atmosphere. It's almost poetic, I tell you. It's amazing. On, on the Hubble, uh, one of the uh, uh, considerations right from the beginning was that it should be a serviceable satellite. It was, it was, it was designed so that you could get inside of it relatively e easily and so on. And I, frankly, I don't know of any, of, of any other satellite that was really designed quite that way. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. I believe that. you're right. You're right. Uh, but uh, uh, on the solar panel, that, it wasn't designed to have to replace the panel. But you can go back to Skylab, which was the, the next, the launch, last launching of, of, of the Apollo. Uh, and on, on that one, uh, I guess, you, you know, we decided to take what was the third stage of the Saturn and just gut it, uh, not, not have any propulsion in it, and fit it out to be a spacecraft, uh, namely, namely a a space station, uh, and when when I got up there, the uh, the solar panels were got fouled up, and uh, one of the real tricks when the when the astronauts first got to it, because uh, it was not launched manned, uh, was to un unravel some some wires that got caught on on it, and so that they could actually so that the panels could spread out and it could start to operate again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or, uh, I don't know if either of you would know, but what is the DoD's involvement like the heavy load, heavy uh, payload uh, aspect of the new CEV project? So. Oh, the Delta IV going out of uh, Vandenberg is carrying classified payload. It's not a dummy either, so it's real. So they, so they have uh, standing requirements for these types of things. Uh, you know, the, the, the national needs go on. Uh, the, the international stage, as we know, is filled with new actors. <coughs> Uh, new threats. Uh, we have what's called unsymmetrical warfare, things that are hard to counter by conventional means. Uh, back in the 70s and 80s, we had symmetrical warfare, you know, submarines versus submarines, missiles versus missiles. Now, as we know, it's much harder, much tougher, but the needs are still there. But is the collaboration between NASA and the military still pretty active? It's not in terms of payloads, it's there in exchange of technologies. Things like development of more efficient sensors, processors, that sort of thing. It's everybody's benefit, for example, to have more powerful, faster, rad-hard uh, space processors. Everybody wins in that type of situation.
Yeah, one thing I just sort of forgot to mention uh, with regard to the man over in the laboratory, uh, it was thought at that time that, uh, that by having men there and their ability to, to, to inspect a fairly wide swath, that they would have time in flying over that swath to do some searching and, and could do a better job of detecting uh, 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 po possible items of, of, of tremendous interest from a, a military standpoint uh, than trying to do it all automatically. And, and of course, what finally uh, uh, hit, uh, washed out that argument was, was the ability to have, have satellites that had almost instantaneous uh, trans transmission of information back home. What was the design for the MOL for crew transportation? Um, they, 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 were, they were going to take off on a, on, a, on a Titan. They were going to be aboard a Gemini. Uh, uh, and they were, they were, they were going to have uh, um, uh, a, a laboratory of sorts which would, which would have the, the necessary reconnaissance and other equipment aboard. So it was similar to Skylab in that you had a non-reusable... Non capsule as the, as the crew transfer. It had a Gemini type return vehicle, but yeah. it, was, uh, it was definitely a very, going to be very quite small and cramped compared there, to Shuttle. There, there was no thought of, of having uh, another Gemini come up and okay. make use of it. Yeah. Why, why did all the, why did Gemini, Apollo, Mercury all land on water? Because that's very expensive when the Russians landed on land. Well, it's very simple. Uh, uh, if you take a look at where the large sites were for, for the Soviets, uh, if they aborted, they had to come down, they had to have the capability of coming down on land for any kind of an abort mission. Uh, similarly, if operating out of, uh, uh, out, of, out of the Cape Canaveral area, uh, if you have aborts, you have to come down in the water. Now the question was then, was it worthwhile to have the capability of doing both? Well, that just added weight. And so we stuck with the water and they stuck with the land.